not lecturing in a fishing shirt. This is just a shirt I wear when I go fishing. Welcome to our final fallacy of clarity discussion. This is distinction without a difference. So we're looking at informal logical fallacies and specifically fallacies of clarity. Fallacies where the argument is weakened by the content. Uh, and in this case, it's unclear language. The speaker is intentionally manipulating the language uh, to muddy the waters and make it sound like uh, he is saying something that he's not, or make it sound like he's saying one thing when in fact he means another. So this is distinction without a difference. So uh, the way your textbook sets this up, uh, your textbook sets this up as almost being the opposite of false analogy. So if you remember false analogy from last quarter, false analogy is when you take two very different things and you make them sound similar as if you can compare the two when really you can't. They're too different to compare with each other. So that common expression, you know, this is like comparing apples and oranges. We want to compare apples to apples, uh, but you're bringing oranges into the picture and orange is not an apple, even if they're both fruit. Uh, so for example, Every time I find myself in a debate about the morality of gambling, somebody is, is almost guaranteed to say, you realize that gambling is no different than investing in the stock market. Yes, both involve uh, risking money, but to imply that it's exactly the same uh, when one person researches markets, researches stocks, uh, maybe finds a low risk mutual fund uh, in order to invest and save for their retirement. That's exactly the same as uh, going to Vegas and playing the slot machines. Well, no, it's not exactly the same. That would be a false analogy. So a false analogy, two different things that we're making sound as if they're similar. Take that definition and flip it and you have distinction without a difference. When you take two very similar statements, but manipulate the language to make it sound, make the two different statements sound, uh, sorry, to make the two similar statements sound very different from each other. Uh, and so hence the silly example at the beginning of the video, this isn't a fishing shirt, it's just a shirt I wear when I go fishing. You mean a fishing shirt. Uh, and one easy example, it pops up in our everyday conversations, even in our own homes. Uh, Let's say I want to go running later. Uh, I, I can't find my running watch. I say out loud, I can't find my running watch. And Mrs. H responds, you mean you lost your running watch again? To which uh, my instinctual response is a defensive, it's not lost. I just don't remember where I had it last and I can't find it. I.e. it's lost. Uh, so, so yeah, we, we don't like to admit we've lost things, so we come up with circumlocutions like, I misplaced it, I just don't remember where it is, uh, it's lost in the shuffle somewhere. So that would be a distinction without a difference. And there's lots of examples out there, it shows up in politics and advertising and especially debates all the time, all the time. Uh, so just a couple of examples that come uh, that, that come to the, off the top of my head. Uh, one example from modern American history. You may or may not have heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, if you haven't heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, this was October of 1962 uh, when our spy planes discovered, uh, when it was almost too late, uh, that the Soviet Union had managed to sneak over 130 medium-range nuclear missiles with warheads into Cuba, 90 miles from the United States, Every American city is potentially a target except maybe Seattle. Uh, and here we are with all these Soviet missiles pointing at us and we didn't even know. So what do we do about this crisis? And one of the first things that President Kennedy did was surround Cuba with American naval warships uh, in order to not let any more Soviet supply ships through to Cuba. Now, here's the problem. Uh, you you heard, just heard me say we surrounded a place with ships and didn't let anyone through. There's a word for that. We call that a blockade. Here's the problem. A blockade is an act of war. A blockade is an act of war with uh, certain 
you know, aspects of international law surrounding it. It's not legal to do if you're not at war with somebody and we're not trying to start a war with the Soviets. We were trying to prevent one. So Kennedy called it a quarantine. Kennedy uh, informs the Soviet Union, we have quarantined Cuba. And the Soviets respond, quarantine? That's a strange word we haven't really heard used in this situation before. What do you mean quarantine? Well, we mean we've surrounded Cuba with ships and you can't get through. Oh, you mean like a blockade? Uh, no, no, not a blockade. That's an act of war. This is not an act of war. It's a quarantine. Big difference. One's called a blockade. The other's called a quarantine. So they're a very famous example of a distinction without a difference. Um, another example comes from politics. And as you know, I like to follow international politics. I like to follow not just our own country's politics, but other uh, politics in other nations as well. Uh, and I love following the UK Parliament. Uh, you, the UK Parliament is, is fascinating to observe, to read about, to watch. Uh, and one aspect of the House of Commons uh, in the Parliament, the legislature of the United Kingdom, uh, that I absolutely love is the concept of unparliamentary language, that there are things you're not supposed to call each other, there are certain ways you are not supposed to address each other, in order to, uh, in order to allow for more courteous, reasonable discourse and conversation among the lawmakers. Uh, at least that's the idea. So, so for using unparliamentary language, uh, you can be suspended from the House for the rest of the day's session. And one example of that unparliamentary language is you can't call anyone a liar. You're not a one member of parliament is not allowed to call another member of parliament a liar or accuse them of telling lies uh, or else you get kicked out of the house for the day. Uh, so you can't call anyone a liar. Imagine that a politi politicians not being allowed to call other politicians liars. Uh, and so what members of parliament will do is find these great euphemistic you know, circumlocutions to get around accusing their colleagues of telling lies without using the word lie. Uh, and my favorite, it comes from Winston Churchill, uh, but recently it was used against the uh, uh, leader of the Labor Party. Uh, instead of saying they're telling a lie, uh, in instead it was said that, that he was guilty of a terminological inexactitude. You didn't tell a lie. I'm not saying you lied. You're guilty of a terminological inexactitude. You, you just said something that's not true. Basically, you said something that's not correct and wrong, but I'm not calling you a liar because then I'd get kicked out of the House of Commons for the rest of the day. So that's distinction without a difference. That's distinction without a difference. Very common, as I said, in debate, very common in politics um, as well as elsewhere. So that is fallacy number 28. That is the final informal fallacy in your textbook. This closes out our study of informal logic. Next year, you're going to be studying formal logic. Formal logic is focused upon the structure of the argument. You'll be looking at a lot of syllogisms, you know, you know premise A, then premise B, therefore conclusion. Uh, but it's important that you have a foundation in informal logic because you can have uh, you can have a valid syllogism. You can have a, a formally valid argument in its structure that's complete nonsense. You can have a syllogism that says, uh, Mr. H drinks a lot of coffee. Teachers drink a lot of coffee. Therefore, Mr. H is a teacher. Okay, so we know that that's actually true. I am a teacher and I do, do drink a lot of coffee, but is that really a sound argument? Is drinking a lot of coffee, in fact, the defining characteristic of a teacher? Well, maybe it is, but uh, it's important to be able to recognize that content in an argument matters as well. So one thing we're trying to do this year is to help you argue better by argue in the correct original meaning of that word, to advance a proposition, to make a proposition, and defend it with evidence and reason. And to do it 
uh, with courage to do it to do it forcefully with courage, but also with courtesy and respect. Uh, for the person you're arguing with. So remember the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter in his first epistle admonishes us to always have a defense uh, for the hope that is in us, but also to make that defense with uh, with gentleness and with respect, that, that this is the respect that we owe to our fellow bearers of the divine image. Uh, and so I hope this uh, study of informal logic was helpful for you. Uh, I hope you're better able to make respectful, true arguments as we defend the truth, as we defend God's truth. Uh, and it has been a pleasure to be your logic teacher this year. And now, since I'd like to go for a run later, I need to find my running watch. <laughs>